放吗？不要不要不要不要！不要打门！怎么能会把人找找到的？不要打门！听见了？不要打门！三个男的，三个男的，三个男的，三个男的，三个男的，一个一个男，不要打门，后面人，后面不要打门。我今天我今天看我今天看，大家要玩捉迷藏，要不要？我们现在都能收。It's nice to meet you, Adam. We've seen, we've we've seen, we've met several times at um, at the um, Tom's event uh, in the past. I know I that. Think. What yeah. are you talking about? <laughs> oh, are you saying? No, no, I'm kidding. Are like... you saying like Doc NYC or something? What... No, no, no. What's that? The series called? He did a series on Tuesdays. Oh, like Stranger Than Fiction became oh, Stranger Than Fiction. Yeah, you were you were his... moderating, right? A uh, couple, of, a lot of his, uh, his screenings, I think. Yeah. I don't remember moderating those. Oh, but I take your word for it. Maybe because I I have, but I've moderated you know, you know over that. the years. Yeah, lots of uh, screenings, and I was involved with Doc NYC ones one year. Yeah, yeah, about you know some years ago, and um, but. Um, was it, were you also, did you have another earlier feature? Yeah, uh, People's Republic of Desire was at Doc and Wesley. That was like 2018. Yeah, that was a while ago. Not that yeah. long ago. Not, not, not that long ago. <laughs> yeah, it, feel, I know it feels anything, a long time ago. Yeah, anything pre-COVID is a long, long time ago. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, well, I mean, you know, talk about quick filmmaking. Uh, when you made this, your documentary, 76 Days, did you think you would be showing it during the pandemic or did you figure that would be kind of already a thing of the past and this would be looking back at this time? Not, I mean, now it's it's actually is the, still the time. So, you know. Have we started? Yeah, sorry. Oh. <laughs> it's the way it goes okay. with my podcast. We kind <laughs> of right. just sort of ease into it naturally. Okay. Uh, yeah, I, 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 I will I introduce you. Oh, by the way, I'm sorry. I'll introduce you. You know, I'll also, I'll, I'll just, I'll make an introduction. Uh, but how, oh, how woo, it's nice to see you. Okay, there, now you've had your introduction. Okay. Stop yeah. avoiding the questions. All right. <laughs> so, no, I mean, I, I didn't know when I started working on this film. Um, mm -hmm. I started in early February. Um, mm -hmm. But at that time, a lot of things was uncertain, right? And that time it wasn't very obvious it was going to become a global pandemic, first of all. Secondly, nobody knew at that time how long the lockdown of Wuhan would last. Uh, you know, in the very beginning, I wanted to make a film more like an investigative piece to figure out what happened, what kind of decision led to the chaos in Wuhan that ended up in, uh, you know, as a lockdown. Um, as I was starting editing, I started editing in April. And at that time, it kind of became clear to me, it was already a pandemic, it was de officially declared as a pandemic. Uh, I knew it would last for a long time, but God knows how long. So I knew I probably would be able to finish the film before the pandemic would be over. Um, Still, I was hoping I would be able to finish the film by hopefully by December, um, right around now. So premiere the film early next year. But then in July, I think by July, by early July it was already pretty obvious. There's not much I could change about the story in terms of with the new direction we were you know, following. 
and once we submitted a cut to TIFF, to Tom Powers, and at that time, it was just like, not much we could change. Why not? If, if Tom would take it, we would premiere it. So that's what ended up happening. Well, did it play, has it played in China? No, it hasn't. Not yet. Uh, not yet. Not yet. We've been out of respect for one of the co-director. One of the co-director wanted to remain anonymous. Um, right. Uh, so but is he based in China or she? It, uh, it, he's based in Wuhan. He's actually a state-owned, yeah. you know, news reporter, uh, photojournalist. And when we started collaborating, he wasn't sure where I was taking the film uh, because I'm the one in New York editing. He and the other co-director, they actually didn't know each other. I mean, they were filming independently. So I talked to them and said, why don't we pull all the footage together? We'll make a feature film together, um, the three of us together. Mm -hmm. um, so he wasn't sure where I would take the film. And the secondly, um, even after I, you know, I talked to him repetitively, I was like, I've, right now I don't want to make any political commentary at all. I wanted to make a universal human story about how people trying to help each other to survive the pandemic. He was still worried in the sense um, that, uh, you know, you never know whether there's some sensors might disprove of the shots and the scenes. And also, more importantly, uh, there's a very ultra-nationalistic internet users in China who has basically been calling out and, uh, you know, bashing and, and anyone who dares to criticize the government in any way. So he's afraid that those people will latch onto this film as something that's portraying China in a you know, negative light or portraying too much on the tragedy or we as a filmmaker are trying to benefit from, from, from this immense tragedy. So he's like, just, you know, don't, 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 don't use my name. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, I, from the, let's let people know, I mean, what we're looking at is a period of weeks in a specific Wuhan hospital. That yeah, is 76 days in the Wuhan 76 hospital. days. I, I, I'm getting the idea that maybe that's that's why you called the film 76 days. But um, it, it, it uh, I wasn't positive if this was the lockdown period. It was. It was. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so, but I, I, when you look at the hospital's response and it starts relatively early in that time period, of course, but uh, other than at the very beginning when you feel, when you're shooting a gr large group of people who are really kind of uh, panicking and trying to get att medical attention. And there, there's a scene that, the, you know, like literally people trying to, you know, storm the gates in a sense, like get in there to get help for themselves or their loved ones. And, but um, other than that, the, the, the incredible, res uh, the setup there, the, 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 everybody's in the, all the medical professionals in their gear, the, the teams that are cleaning the hospital, the, 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 uh, the, the response to all the patients' needs, um, in, in, despite this incredible, overwhelming circumstance, is, is so impressive. Uh, and I just think, if this is a sample of how the city is responding to, to it, it's no wonder they were able to at least, you know, <laughs> handle this enormous crisis and come out of it. And we lift the lockdown after 76 days. It's it's really kind of a remarkable. Now I don't know all of the uh, the downside of what people's human rights and freedoms were that were infringed upon. I'm, I'm assuming there are some. Uh, so the, I guess the question is, what was your sense uh, response to what I'm what I'm seeing in my narrow perspective through your your lens? Is am I am, is the greater story, whereas I write in my interpretation, or I, you know, yeah. we, do you have like a, 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 a dem like an entire population that refuses to participate, or you know, a range of of responses to the vi uh, pandemic? I mean, what what? It's always a struggle for any filmmaker, right? To, to tell a story about any particular event because sure. it's really limited by 
the footage you have access to, first of all, and secondly, your creative intention, because there are so many ways to interpret any given phenomena. Um, the, as you were saying, in the early, um, early part of uh, the beginning of 76 Days, yes, there are two scenes about absolute horror, panic, and the, the, the patients wanted to get in, inside of the hospital. Um, but uh, after those workers, even though they were exhausted, they were kind of like having the situation under control. They were actively caring for, the, um, for their patients. Um, I, I don't, in some ways I feel that's an accurate depiction of at least the, what I will call it the emotional journey of the lockdown, which is that the entire population in that city was, you know, really under distress and there were a lot of fear going around. But then as we, you know, the government sent a lot of doctors, which was briefly talked, talked about in the film, to support Wuhan, the situation was put under control. So, and, oh, so the government was sending in uh, medical professionals from outside Wuhan to deal, right. with the, with right. deal with the, the pop, all, uh, yeah, that, that, I missed that, I guess, um, but that's, that makes sense. Yeah, and also there's PPE being shipped all over, right? I mean, I don't, I mean, back in February, March, even like overseas Chinese, we're collecting like the mask, but buying them in here and elsewhere, send them back to China to alleviate the PPE shortage situation in Wuhan. So yes, all of that was not, none of that was included. The backstory was included in the film. So because that's partly because of creative like intentions, like, there's so much backstories of the beat by beat changes during the lockdown. Um, you know, for me, after I experimented with using news clips and social media video, try to build that, I feel that kind of distracted the viewers from looking at the footage uh, my co-director shot, the really powerful, raw, emotional footage. So in the end, I opted not to tell a beat by beat uh, what happened during those 76 in lockdown. other words let's focus on the chronology side of it aspect yeah that's that overly structured approach you decided to go more verite yeah and just which is really powerful i have to very effective thank you thank you yeah I mean, but going back to the the point is that there there's the first few days of the lockdown was absolute chaos absolute chaos the, the, okay. we're like in the very beginning there were only three hospitals allowed to accept pneumonia patients, COVID patients, right? And those three were completely swamped. And, uh, you, and, but then, I mean, in the end, I debated whether to include some social media clip people shot on their phones of those hosp three hospitals in the early, day, the, the first few days to incorporate at the beginning of the film or not. But then in the end, I decided not to because in terms of emotional impact, the first two scenes of the film are really, can give viewers the impression that there's a, it's very harrowing, you know, to be sick at the beginning of this lockdown. So I opted not to include that to tell the very beginning of this lockdown. Hope that makes sense. Yeah, no, um, it's, a, it's, it's, it's enlightening. Um, uh, I, I do want to talk about like, you know, how, uh, how you were able, how your, I guess it was, the your co-director who shot in the hospital. Where, where were you? I was in New York. I was. Oh, in so New you were you were remotely watching, and you would he would you would uh, he would post the footage for you to to look at on it like near daily basis. Is that how it worked? Or yes. So those two, my two co-directors, they didn't know each other. But I think right now they still haven't met each other. <laughs> they we're filming <laughs> right. independently at yeah. uh, um, four different hospitals and. Uh, so I reached out to filmmakers on the ground, also reached out to journalists in, you know, uh, on the ground in Wuhan, I uh, wanted to find collaborators. And then as soon as I found my, these two co-directors, uh, co I was like, wow, the, 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 it was really powerful because by that time I had read so much about what's, what was happening on the ground in Wuhan, but it's all like words, right? And even though you're, and also I've, saw, I've seen some phone videos posted online, but they were very short. But with my two co-director, they really took me onto the front line, 
face to face with the patient, the medical workers. So, so it was really, truly powerful. So I, I just, I, I, you know, basically asked to collaborate with them and then they were uploading their footage. They were using cloud services in China as a backup solution as they finish shoot, they will, you know, back up their footage onto the cloud and they shared their login mm -hmm. with me. I, you know, I was able to download them in New York and to look at the footage and have discussion with them. But most of the decisions, to be honest, were made by them on the ground because it was so chaotic. Like we would be talking, this character might be interesting, but the next day the character might be transferred to a different hospital or my, you know, uh, yeah, pa a lot of moving pass parts. away, right? It's, it's hard, it's hard to, to track the traditional main character, you know, quote unquote main character for a typical documentary. Well, I want to talk about one aspect. It's a, well, I have had, I, both my parents had COVID. They oh, were both I'm in facilities. My dad died. So, you know, I mean, he, I think he might've died anyway in April. He, he passed away in a facility, in a hospital in Long Island. He had COVID. Uh, he, I think he might've died anyway because he was already septic without getting into great detail about his, his medical problems at the end. Um, I watched the film. It was very hard to watch. Uh, I say that so to people watching. To thank you. I, I thank you. I, I, I say this not to just to deter people. In fact, I think it's an it's essential viewing. And uh, I'm glad I, I'm glad because the film is an enormous payoff in, in a number of ways. And one way is that the there's so much humanity in the in that hospital. Um, under such horrible conditions, you know, people are wearing so much gear and protective gear and they go through hour it's what looks like you know an hour <laughs> at least a day of preparing themselves safely you know but uh even so they're connecting and they're touching and trying to comfort and you know it's like not how i think many westerners like myself uh perceive the average chinese i i just think we have a lot of mis misconceptions about the Chinese people, you know, uh, over the many years that they, but what you see is an incredible amount of compassion. And uh, it was, it was really, you know, caught uh, successfully, I thought in the film. Um, and I think it's so from, you know, I, th I just think that's another uh, component to the film. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm so sorry to hear your story, but uh, I don't know. What what do you think? I mean, based on your personal experience dealing with your parents going through COVID, what how's that experience different or similar to what you saw? In oh, situations? very similar. It's the, the I'm glad you asked me that exact question because you're helping me kind of articulate what what, what I responded to. They're the same people, you know. Again, you don't. It doesn't. Maybe uh, in our daily lives we maybe behave differently, I, you know, in the way we engage and interact. But when life, it's a life and death situation, people are the same. Yeah, exactly. You're uh, responding was... from fear and love and, and those very basic emotions. We're all the same. We resp And you can see it, you know, in these people, their family members that are so, you know, terrified. And, um, you know, you have one couple, older couple that are both in the hospital. Yeah. They're in separate rooms. And, you know, the, the wife is so desperate to make sure that her husband's okay. Cause you know, he's only a few yards away, but he could be dying and she may never see him again. Yeah, they were not allowed to see each other. They were not even allowed to meet in the hallway. That's what, how drastic the measures. I guess here in, in the US hospital, probably the same, same way, right? I don't, you know, it's interesting. Uh, I will tell you one thing, just because I think you'll find it interesting. Uh, when my dad was, uh, I got a call from my the doctor that, uh, when he was hospitalized, and I uh, he said to me, we don't expect him to make it through the night. And uh, so we will make an exception if you want to come see him. Now, I live at the time, I was my son, 16-year-old, was living with me in down in, in, in the city. I'm, I'm not there right now, but, uh, and... I wasn't going to go because I'm, we were, you remember the beginning of April, we were all, didn't have a lot of facts and we were told to stay home and not go out unless you absolutely had to. And we were kind of scared into, you know, quarantining. It was very effective. So, uh, but the doctors offered this. And then my, my son's mother said, you, you need to go. 
because if you don't, you'll regret it. So based on that, I decided I would do it. Now, he had not been even diagnosed yet with, with COVID. Uh, but 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 it, Long Island was the hot spot right then, yep. and that was like the big hot spot. So so I was going into the belly of the beast, and so I w- got there. And as I was getting to the reception desk, uh, just for the dramatic flair, a nine month you know a pregnant couple came in that were about to give birth. I that was the only other people. There was otherwise it was like a ghost town that receiving area. It was just me and this young pregnant couple that walked in looking so like, (laughs) and I just felt, oh my God, that this is otherworldly, you know, but I got to see my dad and sit with him and he was not conscious, but uh, I did, I was able to get in there. And the next day I found out that he did test for, and he did, by the way, he lived another four or five days, but he um, did have COVID, you know, as I said. So I, I'm glad I didn't know that that night that I went. Yeah, it, it was. So it was it similar. Was so, yeah, but they, yeah. No, I know. I, I appreciate it, but I don't. I didn't. The people that were working in the hospital are not nearly. And, and again, beginning of April, so we're talking about three weeks into, barely three weeks into the pandemic, in in New York, and they were not anywhere near as. Uh, I don't know what you call it, but. In terms of uh, their gear, the no. the the uh, approach was not nearly as as uh, uh, extreme. Yeah, because you you have to remember this uh, the the beginning. Some of the early shots were shot in the end of January, beginning right. of February. January and that's how nobody knew how transmissible the virus was. So people basically, I want to sear any you know any way the air can go touch your skin. So that's how fearful people were. In the very beginning, yeah, yeah no, I, I understand. So you're talking about almost a full two months before we. That's right. Yeah, yeah. that's be, gotcha. be, before any any science was available. I was talking to a friend of mine who also grew up in China, and grew up around hospital. She was telling me, um, in China, all you hear about hospital um, is this kind of big tension because the China's healthcare system. Uh, it's even worse than what we have here in terms of there's a lot of conflict between doctors and patients. So she was really surprised to see how, you know, patients and medical workers rely on each other uh, to survive this pandemic. And yeah, that got me thinking too. I I think what you said earlier is like in this kind of life and here in the U.S. as well, right? We complain about our medical system, about hospitals all the time. But in times of life and death, I think it's kind of surprising, it's kind of heartwarming for me as well, because I was in New York when the lockdown happened to see how we really try to support each other, how the people every, every day at 7 p.m. ban the pods and support our medical workers. That was heartwarming that in situations like this, we can rise up and help each other. You were in New York, but you had been planning a trip with your family. That was in January. So January, was, yeah. With so, your husband and your two kids? Yeah, that's right. To so, Shanghai. To Shanghai for Chinese New Year. So we were supposed to fly on January 23rd. So 24 hours before the flight, we learned about this lockdown and we were freaking out. We was like, what does what does that lockdown mean? Does it mean they were they have comf- pretty confident they can control this? So that's why they locked this down, or they took completely lost control. They were in a panic mode. That's why they were locking it down. But in the end, I just flew, I canceled a ticket for my partner and my, our two kids. I, I flew back to China by myself on 23rd. And um, it was really eerie experience to fly back to Shanghai, see a city of 21 million people, Amazing. completely deserted, nobody on the street during China's busiest family holiday. So, but even at that time, I was kind of in denial. I was like, oh, this is kind of intriguing and strange. It didn't register as super real to me. It, I think it, I only felt this pandemic was real when he hit New York, when I saw it second time around, when I feel like mm. the same story that happened in Wuhan were happening in New York all over again. That's when it kind of hit me that COVID-19 was real. You, you got to spend time with your parents. They were both, uh, this is sort of a side note, but they were both had just had cancer surgery oper- surgeries related to their cancer. That's right. That's right. So it was really heartbreaking not being able to bring 
our kids back to see them during Chinese New Year because I honestly don't know how soon they'll be able to see them, if ever, again. How are they um, doing? They are doing okay. I mean, the strange thing is that right now, like in, back in February, everybody want, wanted to get out of China, right? <laughs> to go somewhere else. But now people wanted to get back to China because life there has returned to at least more than half normal. The movie theaters are open, bars and restaurants are open. Uh, people want to get back in and it's hard yeah. to get back in right now. Yeah, but right. my parents are okay. They are really counting days uh, when they can see their grandkids again. Mm. I'm looking forward to that. I'm sure of it. Uh, uh, the, you were talking to Hao Wu, who is one of the three co-directors, right? Of, of 76 Days, a documentary. It's coming out. Uh, uh, it, tell me about that. Uh, or if Jared, you're on, you can um, maybe chat me a note there so I get my facts straight about how people will be able to see it in the coming days. And, sure, uh, I, I can follow yeah, up with that. Oh, yeah, he's there. yeah I, I, I know. Sure. I know the details. Oh, you do too. Okay. I'm sorry. So it's coming out on this Friday, December 4th, and mm -hmm. uh, 46 different virtual theaters all over the US and Canada. So for anybody who want to buy tickets, go visit 76daysfilm.com. And uh, I think Film Forum is one of the films. Yeah, it's, it's it's theater, so a virtual theater. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm, you know, big, big, big fan of Film Forum and any art house cinemas. And, uh, um, we won't go down that rabbit hole right now because <laughs> theaters. Um, so the you you know one of the three your co two direct other co directors as you mentioned uh, requests to stay anonymous, uh, and and I I, I I I what is the issue? I mean this documentary shows an incredibly responsible responsive community of, of medical professionals, uh, of, you know, of, of, of Chinese people that, of, you know, residents uh, that, that went into the hospital terrified and very sick. And in some cases, some died, but many were close to death and survived and came out. So it um, came out okay, uh, were, and, and were released um, and, um, you know, were gr so grateful uh, where there's no negative light on China here, unless it just goes to the broader political politicization. Politization. Why can't I say the word? Politicization. Yep. Politicization of 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 COVID. Right. I think it's and yeah. That China's it, it, blamed for it. Yeah, uh, you're you're actually spot on. I think right now there's a there's in general a, a fear of uh, sticking out and you know talk about this because the U.S. And it's not just US China, right? There's Australia, China as well. There's a lot of finger pointing going on right. uh, in terms of, uh, um, um, you know, a lot of Western countries trying to blame China. Um, and China has become increasingly defensive, aggressively defensive, um, and trying to control the narratives coming out of, uh, out of China about its COVID response. So before we premiered the film at TIFF in September, uh, we honestly, because we were like, cutting the film in secret. We didn't tell anyone about this. Tom Powers at TIFF is one of the fifth people who knew about this, the film's existence, pretty much. We didn't tell anyone. We didn't have any funding when we, um, when we finished, um, you know, uh, we only got some funding once we tried to finish the post-production, the grading or whatever, whatever. Before we picture lock, we didn't have any funding. Um, at that time, we honestly didn't know how audiences or the world will perceive this film. And my Co anonymous co-director, um, it just, he's like, he worked in the state-owned newspaper all his life. You know, he's afraid of any potential backlash, negative so, impact that might affect his job, his livelihood, sure. right? So he's like, you know, um, just just don't, I mean, I keep on telling him, I, I like you, I was like, I'm not, I don't see any political, you know, impl implication here, but, uh, he really wants to be cautious. Um, and right now, especially in our social media age, any shots, any image, any words, oh, yeah. taken out of context can start, in China, Twitter is spam, right? But there's social media storm. And, you know, he just doesn't want anything like that. Understood. Uh, what was the nature of getting 
permission though and allowing them did they understand that you were making a documentary the those who approved your team shooting you're embedded in that emergency well, well the whole hospital was an emergency room right yeah so i the, the government definitely controlled access to the hospital during the lockdown only medical workers patients reporters and state sanctioned reporters TV could go in um, but luckily my both my not luckily i think both my co-directors they are reporters so that's how they can show the reporter's okay. badge and just say i'm here doing this and this um can i get in it's really up to at, at least in the very beginning it's up to the hospital you know the hospital chief to make a decision to whether to allow a reporter to come in or not um, yeah. once they're allowed in they could pretty much, if they are willing to put on the PPE, the equipment, spend all that time to go inside the contamination zone, they have a lot of freedom because it was chaotic, especially in the beginning. Nobody had time to watch over their shoulders in terms of you telling them you can do this, you cannot, you cannot do that. So uh, yeah, so the it, it was it was kind of like yeah, they know I, who they are. So it's I, not like I, they're doing anything subversive. And I guess because, you know, these are not people that are, you know, running with gurneys down lobbies. I mean, most uh, the patients that are suffering from COVID-19 are essentially laying in bed yeah. and they're on ventilators. I mean, yeah. they're not being moved around uh, generally. So maybe the circumstances were you're not going to you're going to be not as much in the way. In yeah. this. Maybe. Yeah. So maybe yeah. it wasn't such a difficult time, but uh, again, it, it's very effective, um, and I'm grateful for uh, the uh, Susan Orchid folks <laughs> for for uh, um, letting me see it. And um, again, Friday, uh, December fourth, fourth, Friday, yeah. December fourth, it'll become available at many art house uh, virtual cinemas. Um, and I'm going to really urge everyone to to uh, purchase their ticket and watch it this weekend. Um, you know, and uh, uh, it just it's great to see, um, yeah, um, uh, such a just a, a a film that gives us a real insight. It's it's an amazing uh, document, you know, and it gives us it's a gift because it lets us see. The, our you know Chinese brothers and sisters uh, you know dealing with this crisis uh, just having the exact same feelings and responses that we do right here it's important thank you you know because um, you know the messages we're getting have been very critical yeah I, I think I think that's one of the reasons I really want to get away from it political commentary in this film right. because we're still living through this pandemic whether each con either country or any country, their response to the COVID, uh, COVID pandemic, whether it's right or wrong or 80, 90% right, it's mm -hmm. hard, it's too soon for us to, to draw any firm conclusion. But what I wanted to highlight is, yeah, it's uh, how common our experiences are across national boundary, across cultures, across different political system, how, yeah, how similar we are. I, I feel like, for us, as we're dealing with more and more global problems like this, and also like global warming, we, we, we yeah, I, I, I think the only way for us to, as a human race to move forward is to be able to seek out more commonality rather than differences and in combating um, yeah, all these um, threats yeah, to our lives. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. And uh, thanks for listening. I, I know I... <laughs> spoke talked a lot but uh yeah. um it was uh nice to bring you on i hope we can do it again yeah next time i really want to learn more about your story actually i found that anytime yeah it's uh i'm, I'm able to talk about it now and not actually st start weeping because it was very i was very raw uh yeah. for the quite a while you know talking about those days but uh um yeah but, yeah my, uh, my grandpa passed away during COVID, not during the, in China, not in Wuhan, but it was, there was, there, there was a period of time he had late stage cancer. We couldn't even get him a bed, hospital bed, even though yeah, it's oh. not in Wuhan because all the hospital beds right. in China were reserved for COVID patients. And he was in suffering so much pain. We couldn't even get him in that side of hospital. 
But then I was I, I knew a volunteer in Wuhan who called some other volunteer in Chengdu where my hometown is. And that volunteer in Chengdu helped connect our family to a community hospital somewhere. And that's how my grandpa was uh, was able to, you know, get at get, get at least get some morphine. So I, I feel right. like yeah, and the and the very beginning of this pandemic, I was kind of be disillusioned with everything that's going on. So angry, so bitter, and but then you know, once you hear about these little stories, uh, how how people really went out of their way to help each other. So I think you know, like your personal experience, my own personal experience, kind of shaped my perception of this whole COVID response on how and shaped how I approach this film and how to tell the story. Um, again, thank you. And, uh, you know, uh, yeah, let's stay in touch and, you know, yeah. have a part two at some point. Okay. Definitely. All Take right. care, Adam. All right, you too. Thanks. Okay.